The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today, what we want to do is uh, discuss various approaches that you might want to take towards trying to understand uh, stochastic systems. In particular, how is it that we might model or simulate uh, a stochastic system? Now, uh, we will kind of continue our discussion of the master equation from last time. Hopefully, now you've kind of thought about it a bit more in the context of the reading. Then we'll uh, discuss kind of what, what it means to be using the master equation and how to formulate the master equation for more complicated situations. For example, when you have more than one chemical species. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the idea of this Gillespie method, which is uh, an exact uh, way to simulate stochastic systems. And uh, it's, uh, it's both exact and computationally um, tractable as compared to what you might call various naive methods. Uh, and the Gillespie method is, is really qual uh, sort of qualitatively different from, from the master equation because uh, in the master equation, you're looking at the, kind of the evolution of probability distributions across the system. Uh, whereas the Gillespie method is really a way to generate individual stochastic trajectories. Okay? So if you start with somehow similar initial conditions, then you can actually get, uh, you can get, for example, the probability distributions from the Gillespie method by running many individual trajectories. But, uh, but it's, it's kind of uh, conceptually rather different because of this notion of whether you're thinking about probabilities or you're thinking about uh, uh, individual instantiations of some stochastic trajectory. And so we'll try to make sense of uh, when you might want to use one or the other. And then, uh, and then finally, we'll talk about this uh, Fokker uh, Planck approximation, which, uh, as the reading indicated, for intermediate uh, ends, it's uh, useful to make this kind of continuous approximation. And then, uh, and then you can get a lot of the intuition from uh, your knowledge about uh, diffusion on uh, unaffected potential landscapes. Okay. Are there any, any questions about this or administrative things before we get going? Uh, I'll, I just want to remind you that the uh, midterm is indeed next Thursday evening, 7 to 9 p.m. If you, are, if you have a problem with that time, then you should have emailed Saurabh. And uh, if you haven't emailed him yet, you should have, do it right now. Um, and yes. Um, okay. All right, so let, let's, uh, let's think about the master equation a little bit more. Okay. Uh, now, before, what we did is we thought about the simplest possible case of the master equation, which is if you just have uh, something being created at a constant rate and then being degraded uh, at, a, at a rate that's kind of proportional to the number of, uh, of that chemical species. Right? And I'm, I'm going to be using the uh, nomenclature that's a little bit closer to what, uh, what was in your reading, just uh, for hopefully clarity. And I think that m some of my choices for, from uh, last lecture were maybe unfortunate. But, uh, so here. This is, for example, uh, m would be the number of mRNA, for example, in the cell. This is the rate of creation of the mRNA, and then uh, the rate of degradation of the mRNA. Okay. So m is the number of mRNA. Okay. And uh, if we want to understand gene expression, we might include an equation for the proteins. So we might have some p dot, for it's some kp. Now, uh, oh, sorry. Again, I always do this. All right, so this, we're going to have this be an n dot. <laughs> All right, so now n is, uh, is going to be the number of the protein. Okay. Now, this really is kind of the simplest possible uh, model that you might write down for gene expression that includes both the mRNA and the protein. Right? So there's no, uh, no autoregulation of any sort. Uh, it's, it's just that the mRNA is uh, involved in, uh, in creating the protein, but then we have, we have degradation of the protein as well. Okay. Uh, so what we want to do is kind of try to understand how to formulate the master equation here. But then also, we want to make sure that we understand what the master equation is actually telling us and how, uh, how it might be used. Right. So first of all, in this model, I want to know, is there, uh, in principle, protein bursts? So before we talked about uh, the fact that, in, at least in, 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 that's in Sonny's paper that we read, we, we, they could observe protein bursts, at least in, that, in those experiments, in E. coli. The question is, 
uh, is there, do, yeah, should, should this model somehow exhibit protein bursts? And you know, why or why not? All right, I just want to uh, see where we are on this. I think uh, this is something that reasonable, you know, that depending on how you interpret the question, you might decide the answer is yes or no. But I'm, I'm curious. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it, it's, it's worth discussing what the implications are here. And uh, you know, and, and the, the relevant part of this is going to be the discussion afterwards. So I, I'd say uh, don't worry too much about what you uh, what you think right now. But I'm just curious. Um, you know, do, you know, this model does it somehow does it include somehow protein bursts? All right, ready? Uh, three, two, one. Okay, so we got um, we got I'd say at least a majority of the people are saying no. Okay, so the um, and can you know may, but then some people are saying yes. So can we can somebody volunteer? Yeah, what's go? You know, why or why not? I, uh, yes. So I think the difference is if we're are we using this in a continuous fashion or are we using it in a discrete fashion? So it takes three yeah. totally bursts. Is it continuous or not? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So he's answered both both possible sides of the argument, yeah. right? And uh, and and the point here is that if you just simulate this from the standpoint, certainly, for example, you know, there's continuous, there's discrete, right? So if, if, you, if you just simulate this as a deterministic pair of differential equations, then will there be bursts? No. Okay? All right. Because everything is well behaved here. Right? On the other hand, if we go and we do what, like a full Gillespie simulation of this pair of, uh, pair of equations, then in the proper parameter regime, we actually will get protein bursts. Okay. Which is in some ways weird, right? That Depending upon the framework that you're going to be analyzing this in, you're going to you can get qualitatively different behaviors for things, right? Um, but there's a sense here that the uh, the deterministic uh, continuous evolution of these quantities would be the average over many of these stochastic trajectories, and the stochastic ones do have bursts. But if you average over many many of them, then you end up getting some well-behaved uh, pair of uh, equations. Okay? So we'll kind of try to make sense of this more later on. But I think that this just highlights that the uh, that you can get really qualitatively different behaviors for the same set of equations depending upon what you're, what you're looking at. Right? And, th and this is not just, you know, it's, uh, and you know, these protein bursts can be dramatic events, right? I mean, that where the protein number pops up by a lot, right? You know, so this, this really then, the, if you look at the individual trajectories here, they would look very different, right? Whether you were doing kind of a stochastic treatment or the deterministic one. Okay. Uh, can somebody? Remind us the situation in which we kind of we get protein bursts uh, in in the stochastic model. But in particular, will we always get pro will we always get these these discrete protein bursts, or what determines the size of a protein burst? Yes. Okay, right. So, okay, so possibly there's a lag time between the time that an mRNA is created and and then the next thing would be. Um, when the protein is right, and the, when the protein is told, right. So that okay, so there are multiple time scales, right. So one is uh, right. So after an mRNA is created, and that's through this process here. Okay, so now out pops an mRNA, right. Now there the, now there are multiple time scales, right. There's the time scale for mRNA degradation. That goes as 1 over gamma m. Right? There's a time scale for protein degradation. You know, after a protein is made, that goes as 1 over gamma p. But then there's also a time scale associated with uh, kind of the rate of protein production from each of those mRNAs. And, the, right, and that's determined by kp. Right? So we get, these, we get big protein bursts if what? What, what is it that what determines you know, this, the size of these protein bursts? Yes. So, uh, use the that shorter, right? right, it's always confusing. Oh, yeah. We were talking about times or right. But in particular, we have protein bursts in the in the stochastic situation, right? If we do a stochastic simulation, and, and that's in the regime if KP, right, the rate of protein synthesis. Uh, from the mRNA is somehow much larger than uh, than this 
gamma n. Am, have I have I screwed up? Okay, yes. Oh, so I was just this is also like in the sense of being different from the deterministic equation, we probably also want the total number of the Is that true? Right. Um, yeah, and I think that, it, and this comes, or the question of, of what mRNA number you need, I mean, it depends on what you mean by protein bursts. I would say that if, um, if so long as this is true, okay, that what that means is that each mRNA will indeed kind of lead to, uh, you know, a burst of proteins being made, where, where the burst is, again, geometrically distributed with some, right? Now, th there's another question, which is, are those protein bursts kind of large compared to the steady state protein concentration, right? And that's going to depend upon, um, KM and, and gamma P as well. Is, is that? Yeah, I guess. I, so I guess that's what I'm interested in, which is, I guess it also depends on how big the time resolution is. All right, well, uh, and you're, you're saying time resolution in terms of just measuring. Yeah, like okay. you, you can see yeah. the Well, OK, but right now we're kind of imagining that we live in this perfect world where we know at every moment of time exactly how many of everything there is, right? So in some ways, we haven't, we haven't said anything yet about time resolution. We're assuming that, that our time resolution and, and our number resolution is actually is perfect, right? Uh, but still, the, depending upon the regime that you're in, the protein right, numbers could look something like, uh, right, so if you look at the protein number, which is, is defined as this n, right, as a function of time, then, you know, in one regime, you're going to see it where, okay, so it's kind of low, you get a big burst, and then you kind of, it kind of comes down, and then, a, and then a big burst, and then it kind of comes down, and it bursts, and it kind of comes down, right? So this, this is in the regime where you, don't, you have infrequent mRNAs being produced and then large, uh, large uh, size bursts from each mRNA. Right? And, then, and then you kind of get this effective degradation or dilution of, of the protein numbers over time. Right? And uh, this distribution, if you take a histogram of it, is what? Right, so I, what I'm, I'm imagining that we, we look at this for a long period of time, right, and then we come over here and we histogram it, right? So now we, we come over here, we turn to the left, we say a number as a function of, this is number n, eh, okay, this is the, uh, the frequency that we observe, some number of proteins, this is a frequency, okay? Um, and, you know, this is going to do something, right? So what, you know, what, what if I, it may not be a beautiful drawing, but... Uh, but you're supposed to know the answer. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to review things for you because I hear that you have a big exam coming up. And I want to make sure that uh, gamma, it's a gamma, right? So this is, um, this is what we learned earlier. So this is a gamma distribution. And you should know what this gamma distribution looks like. In particular, there, there are these two parameters. Describe this gamma distribution as a function of underlying parameters in the model. Maybe. All right. I, I don't want to get uh, get too much into this because I, I because well, on Thursday we spent a long time talking about it. So um, I, you know, if once we get going, we'll spend another long time talking about it again. But uh, but you should you should review uh, review your notes from from Thursday before uh, next before the exam. Okay. Um, okay. So this thing is gamma distributed, and if we looked at the mRNA number as a function of time, and we did a histogram of that. The mRNA distribution would be what? Poisson. It's Poisson. Right? So it's important to remember that you know, just because I tell you that oh, the protein number is gamma distributed, that doesn't immediately tell you exactly what you should be expecting for the, uh, the distribution of, say, the number of proteins as a function of time. Right? I mean, there are many different things I could have plotted over here that would all kind of come down to a, a gamma distribution over here. Right? So it, it's important to kind of keep in mind the different representations that you might want to think about the data. Okay. Um, okay. All right, so what we want to do now is we want to uh, think a little bit more about this master equation in the context of um, if, we, if we're going to divide it up into, into these states. Now, I would say that any time that you are asked to write down the, the master equation for something, right? So now, if how many, how many equations will the master equation 
the, the, how many, yeah, if I, you know, I say master equation, but there is really more than one maybe. Right, so how many, how many master, how many equations will be involved in the master equation uh, kind of description of, of this model? Infinitely many. But there were infinitely many already when we had just one, when we just had the mRNA distribution, right? Well, you know, infinite times infinite is still infinite, right? Uh, so long as it's, you know, still it's, it's a countably infinite number, right? Okay, but um, yeah, but it's still, okay, whatever. It, you know, it's still infinite, always. All right, so what we want to do is uh, divide up the states. All right, so, you know, when somebody asks you for, you know, the, the equations describing how those probabilities are going to vary, you know, really what we're interested in is some derivative with respect to time of some probabilities described by mn, right? We want to know the derivative with respect to time, right? For all mn's, right? So that's why there are infinite number, because m goes in one direction, n goes in another, lots of them, okay? Now, it's always tempting to just write down this derivative and then, and then just write down the equation. Uh, if you can do that, that's fine. But I would recommend that in general what you do is you try to write a little chart out to keep track of what direction these things can go. Okay. So for example, here we have the probability of being the mn state. Right. Now there's going to be ways of going here. And this is going to be going probably of being an m plus 1 n. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you uh, just a couple minutes. And in two minutes, I want you to try to write down as many of the rates, the f's and n's, that correspond to all these transitions. You may not be able to get through all of them. But if you don't try to figure out some of them, then you're going to have trouble doing it at a later date. All right, do you understand what I'm asking you to do? Okay. So next to each one of these arrows, you should write something. All right, so I'll give you two minutes to, to kind of do your best of, of writing these things down. All right. Why don't we uh, Why don't we reconvene and we'll uh, we'll see see how we are. Uh, all right. So this is uh, this is very similar to what we did on Thursday. Right. We have to remember that M's are the mRNAs, and this is what we uh, this is what we solved before. Right. Where it's 
just along, along a row. Okay. Now, first of all, the mRNA distributions and the rates, uh, do they depend on the, um, on the protein numbers? <coughs> no. So what does that mean about, say, this arrow as compared to some, the arrow that would be down, well, down here? It's going to be the same, right? Because N does not appear up in that uh, equation describing mRNA. Okay, if we had autoregulation of some sort, then it would. Okay. But uh, that helps. All right, so let's, uh, let's go through. All right, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to do verbal yelling out. OK, ready? This arrow. Damn. Damn. OK. This one here is 3, 2, 1. KM. KM. All right. All right. Ready? 3, 2, 1. Gamma M times M. All right. 3, 2, 1. Gamma M times M plus 1. OK. Now remember that there are more mRNA over here than there are here, which means that the rate of degradation will increase. Right. OK. Now, uh, coming here, now this is talking about the creation and destruction of, of the proteins, changes in N. All right, this arrow here, ready, three, two, one. It's Kp, right, times M. Right, so this is the rate of creation, right, going from, uh, right, going from N minus one to N. That's fine. Uh, you know, I, I was looking at my notes from last year, and I, I got one of these things into correct, so. Um, Right, and then, okay, ready, this one here, three, two, one. Kp times M. Kp times M, right? So here, it's the same rate, and should we be surprised by that? Right, so the number of proteins are changing, but here it's the number of mRNA that matters, because we're talking about the rate of translation, right? Okay, now uh, this one here, three, two, one. Gamma P times N, and here, three, two, one. Gamma P times N plus 1. All right, perfect. Now, this is, um, of course, as you can imagine, the simplest possible kind of set of equations that we could have written down. Uh, if you have other crazy things, you get different distributions, right? If you have autoregulation or if you have uh, interactions of something with something else um, or the same thing, so forth. But um, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's really very useful to, to kind of write this thing down to, to clarify uh, to clarify your thinking in these in these problems, you know, and then you can uh, and then you can kind of fill out for change of probability of M n. You come here and you just go around and you count take all the arrows coming in, and those are positive. Those are ways of increasing your probability, right? And the ways going out are ways of decreasing your probability. Okay. Now, in all those cases, you have to multiply these raw rates by the probabilities of being in all these other states. So can you use the master equation to get these probabilities uh, if you're out of equilibrium, out of steady state? All right. All right. So that's a question, right? So, you know, so the master equation, useful out of steady state. Yes. All right. Ready? Three, two, one. All right, so we got um, a, a fair number of. Yeah, so it, um, it, there, there is some disagreement, but yeah. So it actually, the answer is yes. Okay, and that's because you can start with any distribution of probabilities across all the states that you'd like. It could be that all of the probabilities at one state. It could be that it's just however you like, right? And the master equation tells you about how that probability distribution will change over time. Okay, now if you let that run. Forever, then you come to some equilibrium steady state, uh, and that that tells you, know, and that's a very interesting quantity is the steady state distribution of these probabilities. But you can actually calculate from uh, from any initial distribution of probabilities, evolving to any later time t, what the probability would be later. Okay. This comes to another question here. All right, so let's imagine that at time t equal to zero, I tell you that there are m not mRNA and p not. And not, I, I always do this. This is, I don't know, somehow my brain does not like this. Okay, and not, right, because the P's, we want to be probabilities, okay? Um, all right, we start with M not mRNA, N not protein, okay? 
Now we, um, you know, and, and, and maybe it's a complicated situation. You know, we can't calculate this analytically. So what we do is we go to our computer and we have it solve how this probability distribution will evolve so that time t equal to some time, if we'd like, we could say this is t1. Um, I, I'll tell you, oh, the probability of having m and n mRNA and protein is going to be equal to something p1. Okay. Now the question is, let's say I then go and I do this simulation again. Okay. Now I calculate some other at time t1 again. The probability that you're in the m n state. The question is, is will you again get p1? All right. So this is a question mark, and a is yes. B is no. All right, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Uh, I think that this is uh, very important that you understand kind of what the master equation is doing and what it is not doing. I'm sorry, what's that? Right, OK. So I mean, you know, this is just, uh, you know, uh, you, know you, you program in your computer to solve this master, you know, these, you know, to use the master equation to solve how the probabilities are going to evolve. Right? I'm, I'm just telling you, you start with some initial distribution. And you, if you do it once, it says, oh, the probability that you're going to have m, and you know, this time you're going to have m, 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 m RNA and proteins is going to be p1. It says 10%. Okay, great. Now I'm asking just you know, if you go back and do it again, will you again get 10% or, will you, or, is, the, um, or is this output stochastic? Okay, it's OK that if you're confused by this distinction, um, I think that it's easy to get confused by, which is why I'm doing this. But um, all right, let's, let's just see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. OK. Um, all right, so I'd say a majority again, you know, but we're kind of at the 80, 20, 75, 25. A majority here are saying that, uh, yes, you will get the same probability. Okay? Uh, and this is uh, very important that we understand uh, kind of where, this, you know, where the stochasticity is somehow embedded in these different uh, representations of, this mo of these modelings. All right, so this, this, the master equation, right, it's a set of differential equations telling you about how the probabilities change over time, given some initial conditions. Right? Now, we're using these things to calculate the evolution of some random process, but the probabilities themselves evolve deterministically. Okay. So what that means is that although these things are probabilities, if you, do, if you start somewhere and you use the mass equation to solve, you get the same thing every time you do it. Okay? Now, this is not true for the Gillespie simulation, because that you're looking at an individual trajectory. Right? An individual trajectory, then, the, then the, the stochasticity is embedded in that trajectory itself. Right? Whereas in the master equation, the stochasticity arises because these are probabilities that are calculating. And so any individual instantiation will be probabilistic, because you are sampling from uh, those different probability distributions. Okay. Now, this is, I think, a sufficiently important point that if there are questions about it, we should talk about it. Yeah? How do you make those um, simulations? Would you essentially, can you take a sum over different Gillespie? OK, so it's true that you can, you can do a sum over different Gillespie. Okay. Uh, no, but okay. I, we haven't yet told you about what the Gillespie algorithm is, so, I'm, you know, so I can't use that. But, um, but indeed, uh, you can just use a standard solver of differential equations. Right? So whatever program you use is going to have some way of doing this. Right? Um, and, and once you've written down these equations, the fact that these are actually probabilities doesn't matter. Right? So those could have been something else. Right? So this, this could be the number of eggs on what, whatever. Right? Uh, so then, uh, so yeah, so once, you, once you've gotten the equations, then the equations just tell you how the probabilities are going to change over time. Some number? 
Oh, no, that's not at all a silly question. Um, right, so, um, yeah, because, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> right. Exactly, right. Um, and uh, yes, no, that's a very, that's a very good question. Uh, and right, so I told you this is an infinite set of differential equations, and uh, but the, you know, but at the same time, I told you this mass equation is supposed to be useful for something, right? And, and um, kind of at the face of it, these are incompatible ideas, right? Uh, and and the basic answer is that um, you you have to you have to include all the states where there is a you know sort of non-negligible probability. Okay. Now uh, let's let's I mean, we can be concrete though. So let's let's imagine that we have. That I tell you, we want to look at the mRNA number here. Okay. And I tell you that, okay, Km is equal to, um, well, okay, well, let me make sure, okay, gamma m. All right, what are typical lifetimes of mRNAs in, in bacteria again? Right, order a minute. So, so that, that means that, we, well, let's say this is 0 0.5 minutes to the minus 1. Right, to give a, a lifetime of uh, around two minutes. Okay. Um, all right, and then let's imagine that this is then all right, 50 per minute. All right, so an mRNA is kind of made once a minute. Oh, uh, there's 50 of them. Per, that's a lot, but all right, whatever. There are a few genes. All right, I, I wanted the number to be something. Yeah. All right, so it's a fair rate of mRNA production. Okay. Now. Um, how many equations do you think you might uh, need to simulate? All right, so we'll think about this. First of all, does it depend upon the initial conditions or not? Yeah, it, it, it does. So, okay, so, all right, <laughs> so be careful, right? Um, in particular, okay, but let's say that I tell you that we start with 50 mRNA. Right. The question is, how many equations do you think you might have to write down? And let's say we want to we want to understand this, you know, and, and you know, once it gets to say the equilibrium. Okay. All right. Number of equations. All right. Give me give me a moment to come up with some reasonable <laughs> options. Uh, All right, well, these are, um, I'll say if you were to actually, I mean, let's say that, you know, that this could show up on your homework, right? So the question is, how many equations are you going to program into your, um, into your simulation? Um, and it may be, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly any of these numbers, but, you know, order. Do you guys understand the question? No? All right. So we need a different equation for each of these, um, each of these probabilities. Right? So in principle, we have uh, an in the mass equation gives us an infinite number uh, of equations. Right? So we have d, the probability of having 0 mRNA with respect to time. Right? That's going to be, yeah, does anybody any, any idea what this is going to be? Right, so we have a minus km times what? Times p0, right? So this is because, you know, if we start out down here, p0, now we have km. All right, so I, I was just about to violate my rule and just write down a, a, an equation without drawing this thing, but. Um, all right, so it's you know it's km times p zero. That's a way of you lose probability, but you can also gain probability, right? At a rate that is goes as gamma m times p one. Okay, all right. So that's 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 how this probability is going to change over time. But we have a different equation for you for p one, for p two, for p three, for p four, all the way in principle to p. You know, one million six hundred eighty-three thousand, blah blah blah, right? So that's problematic, right? Because if we have to actually in our program code up, you know, a hundred million equations, or or it could be worse, right? You know, uh, then 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 you know we're gonna have trouble with with our with our computers. 
Right? So, so you always have to have some notion of what you should be doing. And this also highlights that uh, it, it's, it's really important to have some intuitive notion of what's going on in your system uh, before you go and you start programming. Right? Because uh, other, if, you know, in that case, well, you're likely to write down something that's wrong. You won't know if you have the right answer. And you might do, you know, do something that doesn't make any sense. Right? So, um, yeah, so you have to have some notion of what, what the system should look like before you even start, um, start coding it. Okay. Do, 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 Mike, what question is, how many, how many of these equations should we simulate? All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's uh, let let let's just see where we are. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay. So I'd say that we have, um, you know, I, you know, it's basically between C and D. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, some people are maybe more careful than I am. All right. Can can one of the D's uh, maybe defend why they're, why they're saying D? OK, the mean is 100. And when you say, I mean, I think that whatever you're thinking is correct, but I think that the, the words are a little dangerous. Why, and why am I concerned about, you said the, OK, I mean, is, is the mean 100 for all time? At steady state, right. And I think that, that, that was the key. You know, it's just that, yeah. So um, for long times, the, the mean number of mRNA will indeed be 100. Right? So the mean number of m, in this case, will be km divided by gamma m, which is going to be equal to 50 divided by that. That gives us 100. Okay. Now, will it be exactly 100? No. It's going to be 100 plus or minus what? Yeah. Plus or minus 10. Right. Because this distribution at steady state is what? It's Poisson. What's the Variance of a Poisson distribution, it's equal to the mean. OK, so for Poisson, the variance is equal to the mean. Right. The variance is the square of the standard deviation, right? which means that this is going to be plus or minus 10. That's kind of the typical width of the distribution. Right, so what it means is that at equilibrium, we're going to be at 100. And it's going to kind of look like this. All right, so this is, you know, this might be 2 sigma, so this could be 20, but you know, each of these is 10. All right. So if, if you want to capture this, then you, you might want to go out to a few sigma, right? All right, so let's say you want to go out to 3 sigma, then you might want to get out to 130, maybe. All right, you know, so then. If you want to be more careful, you go up to 140, 150. But this thing is going to decay exponentially, right? So you don't need to go up to 1,000, right? Because the probability is going to be 0, 0, 0. Certainly, once you're at 200, I'd say don't have to worry about it. Okay, but of course, you have to remember the initial condition. We started at 50. Okay. So we started at this point, which means we definitely have to include that equation. Otherwise, we're in trouble, right? Now, how much do we have to go? to the um, kind of below 50. Any? My guess would be that it would be not much more than a few times 5. Because, yeah. because if it were already at equilibrium, that would be the mean. But it's not. And so the driving force is still going to push it back to the drive. That's right. So there's going to be, uh, it's going to be a biased random walk here where it's going to be sort of maybe twice as likely at each step to be moving right as to moving left. That means it could very well go to 49, 48, but you know, it's not really going to go below 40, say. You know, of course, you have to quantify these things if you want to be careful. But certainly, I would say going from, I don't know, 35 to 135 it would be fine with me. You would get full credit on your problem set. Okay. And so we'll say uh, I'm going to make this up kind of from 35 to 135. 134, just so it could be 100 equations. So I'd say I'd be fine with 100 equations. Okay. So 
So you would simulate the change in the probabilities of P35 to P134, for example. Okay. Right, so although in principle the master equation specifies how the probabilities for an infinite number of equations are going to change, uh, you only need to simulate a finite number of them depending upon uh, the dynamics of your system. Okay. Yes, that's a very thank you for the question because it's a very you know very important practical thing. Yeah. So in practice, do you ex like in practice you don't know like, what the solution is like which is so like why you would yeah. simulate it. Do you like expand your range and yeah. see if the solution changes? Right. So the question is yeah in this in this case it's a little bit cheating because we already kind of knew the answer, right? Um, we didn't know exactly how the time dependence was going to go. Right? How is it that the mean is going to change over time on average? No. Exponentially, right? So on average, you will start at 50, you exponentially relax to 100, right? Yeah, but, but in many cases, we don't know so much about the system. And I'd say that what you can, uh, what in general, what you can do is you have to always specify a finite number of equations. <laughs> but then what you can do is you can put in kind of maybe like reflecting boundary conditions or so. On the end, so you don't allow them, you don't allow probability to escape, okay? But then, and then what you can do is you can run the simulation, and if you have some reasonable probability at any of your boundaries, then you know you're in trouble, and you have to extend it from there. Right? Yeah, so you can, for you know, you can look to say, oh, is it above 10 to the minus three or four, you know, whatever, and then if it is, then you have, then you know you have to go further. Right? Okay. Any other questions about how? You're actually going to be doing simulations of this, so you know these are relevant questions for you. Um, okay. All right. Um, okay, so that, that's okay. That's that's the master equation. Uh, but I'd say the, the key key thing to remember is that it is it tells you how to calculate the deterministic evolution of the probability of these states. Uh, given some poten potentially complicated set of interactions. Okay. Now, a, a rather orthogonal view to the master equation is to use the Gillespie algorithm, or in general, to do st direct stochastic simulations of individual trajectories. Yeah, question before we go. Um, um, so if this just set to zero, the probability outside the range, will we be losing probability? Right. Um, okay, so, it's right. so the question is whether we're somehow losing probability. Okay, so what, what I was proposing before is that all right, you, you always want probabilities to sum to 1. Otherwise, you know, it's not a probability, and the mathematicians get upset. Um, and and, you know, and the, key, the key thing there is that you, know, you, you want to start with, I mean, you, you, you have to include all the states that have probability at the beginning. Right? So, okay, so in that sense, you know, you're given an initial distribution, and you have to include all those states. Otherwise, you're, you're definitely like, going to do something funny. Um, right, so you start out with a normalized probability distribution. And then I guess what I was proposing is that you have a finite number of equations, but you don't let the probability uh, leave or come in from those ends. Right? And if you do that, then you will always have a normalized probability distribution. Of course, uh, at the ends, you've kind of violated the actual equations. Right? And, and that's why you have to make sure that you don't have significant probability in, in, at any of your boundaries. Does that answer? Not quite. <laughs> Excuse me. So I was not suggesting that you set the probabilities equal to zero. I was suggesting that you do what's kind of like what 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 the equations actually do here, which is that you don't allow any probability to leave. You know, there's no probability flux on this edge, right? So for example, out at p134, I, I would just say, okay, well here's the probability that you're you have 134 mRNA, and I would get you know in principle there are these two arrows, right? But I, I would just but you can just get rid of them. Okay. So now. Um, now, any probability that enters here you know, can only come back. Right now, and I've, I've somehow violated my equations, but if P134 is essentially 0, then it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right? OK. Um, right. So instead of looking at an individual, um, or sorry, instead of, instead of looking at these probabilities evolve kind of as a, as a whole, you can instead look at individual trajectories. Right? So the idea here is that if we Start with the situation. Actually, we can take this this thing here. Okay, we have um, so we know that at steady state it's going to be 100. It starts out at 50, and in this case, right, with the master equation, you say, okay, well, you start out with all the probability right here. So you have kind of a delta function at 50, right? But then what happens is this thing kind of evolves, and over time, you end this thing kind of spreads. 
until you have something that looks like, right, looks like this, right, um, where you have a Poisson distribution centered around 100. And, uh, and this, this Poisson distribution is going to be very close to a Gaussian, right, because so, you have a significant number. Right? So the, the master equation tells you how this probability distribution evolves. Okay? Now, if we, this, is, this is the number m, and this is, the, uh, this is the kind of the frequency that you observe it. Right? So we can also kind of flip things so that we instead plot the number m on the y-axis. Okay. And we already said, OK, the, the deterministic equations will look like this. And the characteristic time scale for this is what? One over gamma m, right? So this thing relaxes to the equilibrium, time scale determined by the degradation time of the mRNA, right? So this is these are things that should be really you you want to be kind of drilled into your head, and I'm trying to drill, uh, so you'll you'll hear them again and again. All right, now. The, the master equation, indeed, since everything's linear here, the expectation value over the probability distributions actually does behave like this. Right? So the mean of the distributions as a function of time look like that. Uh, and in some ways, if we were to plot this, you would say, OK, well, first of all, it's all here. Then it's kinda, it kind of looks like this. Right? So the, this is somehow how those probability distributions are kind of expanding over time. Okay? Now, for in individual trajectories, if we run a bunch of stochastic simulations, We'll get something that on average looks like this, but it might look like this. A different one might look like this, okay, um, and, and so on. Whoa. Although they shouldn't converge there, you know, because that's not consistent, right? So you, well, you, and if, if you did a histogram at all those different times of the individual stochastic trajectories, you should recover the probability distribution that you got from the master equation. Right, so this is a powerful way just to make sure that, for example, your simulations are working, right? That you can check to make sure that everything behaves um, in a consistent way. Okay, now, there's a major question, though, of how is it that you should generate these stochastic trajectories? Okay. And um, the, the, the sort of most straightforward thing to do is to just um, divide up time into a bunch of little delta t's and just ask whether anything happened. Okay. So uh, let me. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to imagine we have uh, maybe M chemical species. OK, so now these are different M's and N's. So be careful. M chemical species, they could be anything. could be proteins. They could be small molecule, something, right? And there are n possible reactions. And indeed, in some cases, people want to study the stochastic dynamics of large networks, right? So you could have 50 chemical species and 300 chemical uh, different reactions, right? So this could be rather complicated. Okay. Um, and these m chemical species have, um, we'll say, numbers, uh, or if you'd like, in some cases, it could be concentrations, uh, x, xi. So then the whole thing can be described by some, some vector x. Okay. And, and the question is, you know, how should we simulate this? Okay. Uh, the so-called, what we often call the naive protocol. And this is indeed what I did in graduate school, because nobody told me that I wasn't supposed to do it, um, is that you, uh, you divide time into little time segments delta t. small delta t, and you just do this over and over. And, and for each delta t, you ask, OK, did anything happen? Okay. If it did, then uh, you update. If not, you keep on going. Right? Uh, now, the, the problem with this approach, well, yeah, I don't know. What, what is the problem with this approach? Yeah, time is continuous. OK, so this is, um, all right, so one problem is that, uh, well, you, know, you don't like discrete time. That's, that's understandable. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm going to say, well, you know, the details. You know, delta t may be a small, so you, know, you won't notice. <coughs> small, I'm saying if, if I said delta t being small, then I'm going to claim that you're not going to notice that, that I've. That I've 
Right, but then the simulation is slow, right? So there's a fundamental trade-off here. And in particular, the problem with this protocol is that for it to behave reasonably, delta t has to be very small, right? And, and, if it, um, and, and what do I mean by very small, though? That's right. And, right. The, in, for this to work, delta t, and this delta b has to be um, s such, that, um, such that unlikely for anything to happen. But this is already a problem, because that means that we're doing a lot of simulations and then just, and nothing's happening, right? You know, uh, OK, and how, do we, um, how do we figure out? What that probability is. Right. So, in particular, we can ask about well, given um, and okay, possible reactions, we'll say with rates um, r sub i. Right. So, the probability that the ith reaction occurs uh, is equal to uh, r i times delta t. For, for small delta t, because okay. uh, each of these reactions will occur kind of at a, at a rate. You know, they're going to be uh, they're going to be exponential distributions of the times for them to occur. You know, this is a Poisson process, right? Because it's random. Now, uh, what we want to know is the probability um, that nothing is going to happen, right? Because that's what that's how we're going to have to set delta t, right? Well, what we can imagine then is that, you know, then we can say, all right, well, what's the probability that is, say, you know, not, not reaction one uh, and uh, not two and, okay, dot, dot, dot. Okay. Well, and this is, this is in some time delta t. Right. Well, actually, we know that if, if the fundamental process just looks like this, then we're going to get exponential distributions for each of those. Right? So we get, end up with e to the r1. And indeed, once we write an exponential, we don't even have to write delta, uh, delta t. This is just some time t. Right? For this to be true, it requires that delta t is very small. Right? But if we want to just ask, what's the probability that Reaction one has not happened in some time t. This actually is indeed precisely equal to e to the r one t. Okay. Yeah, details. Um, all right. And this is e to the minus r two t. Dot dot dot. That minus. And there, this we go up to n r to the n t. Okay. Because each of those chemical reactions are going to be exponentially distributed in terms of how long you have to wait for them to happen. Okay. Um, and what's, what's neat about this is that this means that if you just ask about the probability distribution for, um, for, uh, you know, for all of them combined, by saying that none of them ha have happened, this is actually just equal to you know, the exponent, exponent of minus. Now we might, put the, we might pull the t out, and we just sum over ri. Right, so this is actually a, somehow a little bit surprising, which is that each of those chemical reactions occur, they're occurring at different rates. Some of them might be fast, some of them might be slow. The RIs could be different by you know, orders of magnitude. Okay. But still, over these hundreds of chemical reactions, if, if, the, if the only thing you want to know is, oh, what's the probability that none of them have happened, that is also going to end up, that's going to decay exponentially. Right? And this actually tells us something very interesting, which is that if we want to know the distribution of times for the first thing to happen, that's also going to be exponentially distributed. Okay. And it's just exponentially distributed with a rate that is given by the sum, sum of the, these rates. Okay. Now, that, uh, that's the basic insight behind this Gillespie algorithm, where instead of dividing things up into a bunch of time, little times delta t, but instead, what you do is you ask, um, how long am I going to have to wait before the first thing happens? Okay. 
and you just sample from an exponential with this rate r that is the sum of the rates. Okay. Um, oh, and maybe it's even worth saying that, okay, so there's the, the naive algorithm where you just divide a bunch of delta t's and you just take the little steps. You say, okay, nothing, 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 and then eventually something happens, and then you update and you keep on going. There's the somewhat less naive algorithm, which would be, which is exact, you know, so it's not the same concerns that Jay had, which is that you could just sample from n different exponentials, you know, each with their own rates, and then just take the minimum of them. And say, so, okay, that's the guy that that's guy to happen first, and then update from that. And that's an exact algorithm, right? But the problem is that you have to sample from many, possibly many different exponentials, right? And then, uh, and that's not a disaster, but again, it's computationally slow. So the Gillespie algorithm removes the requirement to sample from those n exponentials because instead, what you, what you do is you just say uh, this, you know, so the the numbers or the concentrations uh, give all of the, uh, you know, give you know, the ri, give you all the rates. Okay. Right, and then what you do is you uh, sample from, um, from, an, uh, from an exponential um, with rate um, r, which is the, the sum over the, all the ri. And that tells you, oh, okay, when is the first reaction going to occur? And then what you do is you ask, well, which reaction did occur? Because you actually don't know, know that yet. Right? And, and there, it's just the probabilities of each of them. So the probabilities pi is just going to be the ri divided by the sum over the ri, so this big R. So it may be that you had 300 possible chemical reactions, but you only have to do two things here. And they're both kind of simple, right? You sample from one exponential. It gives you how long you had to wait for something to happen. And then you just sample from another prob simple probability thing here that just tells you which, which of the, you know, the n possible chemical reactions was it that actually occurred, right? And of course, the chemical reactions that were occurring at a faster rate have a higher probability of being chosen. So this actually is an exact procedure in the sense that there's no, uh, no, no uh, kind of digitization of time or anything of the sort. Right? So this actually is um, it's computationally, computationally efficient and, um, and is exact, you know, assuming, that you live, assuming that your description of the chemical reactions was accurate to begin with. Right? Um, right, so then what we do is we update time. And I, this is in some ways, uh, you know, for, when you do computations, when you, when you actually do simulations, this is maybe the annoying part about the Gillespie algorithm, which is that now your times are not equally spaced. And so then you just have to make sure you keep track, you remember that, and you don't plot something that's incorrect. Right? But because you, your times are going to hop right, at different time intervals. Um, but you know, that's doable. Up to, uh, you have to update your time, and you have to update your, uh, your abundances. Okay? And, then, uh, and then what you do is repeat. And I think the notes kind of allude to this Gillespie algorithm, but don't qu are not quite explicit about you know, what you actually do in all, uh, to, go, to go through this process. Right? For the simulations that you're going to do in this class, I would say that you, you, do, the, the, you don't get the full benefits of the Gillespie in the sense that you're not going to be simulating hundreds of differential equations with hundreds of you know, things. Um, but it, it's in those complicated uh, models that you really have to do this kind of Gillespie approach as compared to even this somewhat more um, you know, better model, which is you sample from the different exponentials. Right? Are there any questions about why this might work, why you might want to do it? Yes? Right. Um, what I mean is that you, um, you go to MATLAB and you say, you know, random. No. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm sort of serious. but. Uh, Sorry, I'm trying to get a new. Uh, okay, right. So you have a the exponential, right? So it's a it's a probability distribution, right? So this is uh, the probability as a function of time, uh, as a you know, and then t, right? 
And it's going to look something like this. All right. This thing is going to be some, well, given that, given that all right, in general, it's going to be the probability t is going to be e to the minus r t. And then do I put r here or do I put 1 over r? Is it 1 over r? OK, well, what, what should be the units of a probability distribution? 1 over time, in this case, right? It's 1 over whatever is on this x-axis. Because if you want to get the actual honest-to-goodness probability, right? So this is the, if you want the probability that um, t is, say, between some t1 and t1 plus delta t, right? If you want an actual probability, then this thing is equal to the probability density at t1, in this case, times delta t. Okay. So that means this thing has to have a 1 over time, and that gives us r here. Okay. All right. So now, okay. So this is probability density, right? And and what I'm what I'm saying is that you want when I say sample from this probability distribution, what it means is that it's like rolling a die, okay? But that it's a biased die because it's a continuous thing over the time, right? But it's just like when I you know when you have when you have a six-sided die and I say okay, you know, sample from the die, you're playing Monopoly, you throw the die and you get you know one two three four five six and you do that over and over again, right? Same thing here. You kind of you know roll the die, and and see what happens. And indeed. In, uh, you're going to get some practice with probability distributions on the homework that I think you're doing right now because you, you're asked to demonstrate that you can take, you can sample from a uniform distribution, right, which is something that's just equally probable across the unit, um, unit line, and, and do a transformation and get an exponential distribution. Um, now, and it used to be that everybody knew all these tricks because you had to kind of know them in order to do computation, but now I mean, MATLAB or whatever program you use, they know all the tricks, so you just ask it to sample from an exponential with this uh, property, and it does it for you. Right? But you still need to know what it's doing. Right? So just to be clear, what is the most likely time that you're going to get out from the exponential? Zero. Right? Okay. It has a peak here, but the mean is over here. Any other questions about, about what the, you know, how the Gillespie algorithm works? And um, all right, can somebody tell me how a protein burst arises? All right, so we, we had this original question about whether there were protein bursts in that model that I wrote down, right? Where we just had m dot is equal to. Now, I, you know, what, we had the, what, we, what, what we said was that the mass equation would not, I mean, the protein bursts would somehow be there, but you would never see them. Or you know, that somehow the protein bursts would influence how the, how the mean and everything have evolved, but you wouldn't actually see any big jumps. Right? But then we said, oh, but if you did a stochastic simulation, you would. Right? So the claim here is that, sto that the Gillespie algorithm, what I've just told you here, will lead to protein bursts. Okay, but what do I mean by when I when I when I make that statement? What is it that I actually mean? If we do a Gillespie of this, will the okay? Well, let's just hold on. Let me let me do a quick vote. Will we have cases where delta n is greater than one? You know, if I go through this process, if I'm using the Gillespie, and I'm tracking how mRNA and protein number are changing over time, will I get you know, these things, protein bursts, where, where delta n is larger than 1 in one of these time cycles. Okay. Okay. Ready? 3, 2, 1. Okay. All right. So we got, so most of the group is saying that's going to be no. But, uh, but it's not, you know, again, there, it's, it's mixed. So, so can somebody say why, why we don't get? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it seems like the structure of the simulation is to make sure only one thing happens. That's right. 
Yeah, so the simulation as written, and you could imagine some sort of phenomenological version of this where you allowed actually for protein birth. But in, as kind of specified is that we ask, you know, what's the time for one thing to happen? Right? Now, uh, why, you know, but, then, but the claim somehow is, OK, well, we can still get protein bursts from this. And, and how, how does that happen? Yeah. Yeah. For example, right? If we didn't have an mRNA before, and then we got an mRNA, what it means is that if you look at n as a function of time during one of these protein bursts, but you know, before I was drawing it just hopping up, but really in the context of the Gillespie, it would be that it would hop, hop. You know, so there would be little time jumps, right? So this is a protein burst, but it's that, oh, it's, it's really before this mRNA is degraded, you get 1, 1, 1, 1. Right, so each of these is, is delta n of 1, right? OK, so this is, uh, you know, whatever, 6, 7, right? And then, and then what can happen is that we get the mRNA degraded, right? And so then we're going to get a slower thing where it look, you know, it looks like that, right? So the Gillespie, everything is uh, in. Uh, everything's being created and, and destroyed in units of one, but it could be that the time interval over this burst is just very short, so then it goes up very quickly, but then it's slower to go away. Okay. Right. So uh, what I want to do in just the last 15 minutes is talk a bit about the Fokker-Planck approximation. Um, I would say that you know, all of these different approaches are useful to varying degrees in terms of actually doing simulations, doing analytic calculations, Getting intuition and um, and the Fokker-Planck approach, it give you know I'd say it's more or less useful for different people depending on um, what you're doing. Okay, so uh, the the basic idea is as kind of you you answered in, in the pre-class reading is that um, in cases where n is is large enough that you don't feel like you need to take uh, into account the discrete nature of the molecules, um, yet at the same time it's not so large that you can totally ignore the fluctuations then. The Fokker-Planck approach is nice because it allows you to get some sense of what's going on without all of the crazy details of, um, for example, the master equation. Um, but, uh, and, and then it also, because of this idea of an effective potential, uh, it allows you to bring all the intuition from that uh, into your study of these gene circuits. Um, now, I'm not going to go through the whole derivation, but, uh, but if you have questions about that, please. Uh, come up after class, and I'm happy to go through it with you because it's um, you know it's it's sort of fun, um, but um, but the, the notes you know do do go over it. Uh, I think that what's perhaps useful to just remind ourselves of is how it maybe leads to uh, you know this ga a Gaussian with some width depending upon the shapes of the production degradation curves. All right, so the basic notion here is that depending on these F, the Fs and Gs, the production, production degradation terms, we, we get different shaped uh, effective potentials. Okay. All right. Now, all right, so in general, we have something that looks like, okay, we have some n dot, there's some Fn, and then there's a minus Gn. So for example, for something that has just simple expression, uh, in the case of, let's just imagine now that there was, if you want, we could say it's a protein that is just, or it's just some k minus gamma n. Or if you'd like, we could say, oh, this is mRNA number. You know, but something that's just simple production, and then uh, first order degradation. All right, the question is, how, how, do, we, how do we go about uh, understanding this in the context of the Fokker-Planck appro approximation? And, and it turns out that you can uh, write it in what is a, uh, essentially a, some, a diffusion equation where you have some probability flux that is, um, that's moving around. And, and within that realm, you can you know, write that the, the, the probability distribution of the number is going to be something that describes. So there's going to be some constant. There's the f plus g. And they're both, these are both functions of n. Uh, and then you have an e to the minus phi n. Right. So the idea here is that this behaves as some effective potential. Uh, 
Of course, it's not quite true because f and g also are functions of n, and they're not in here. But this is the dominant term because it's in the exponential. And here, phi n is defined as the following. So it's minus this integral over n of the f minus g and f plus g dn. And we might integrate over n prime. Okay. And we, we're going to uh, kind of go through what some of these different f's and g's might look like to try to get a sense of why this happened. Okay. Uh, it is worth mentioning that you can do this for any f and g that um, where, when it's just in one dimension. Right? So you just have n. Once you have uh, it in two dimensions, right? so once you actually have mRNA and protein, for example, um, you're not guaranteed to be able to write it as an effective potential. Uh, right? uh, although, I guess, if you're, if you're willing to uh, invoke a vector potential, then, uh, then, uh, then, maybe, uh, then maybe you can. Right? But uh, in terms of just a, a simple potential, then uh, you can do it in one dimension, but not necessarily in more. Okay. Um, and I think that, in general, our intuition is not as useful when you have the equivalent of magnetic fields and so forth here anyways. All right. What I want to do is just try to understand why, uh, why this thing looks the way it does for, um, for this simple regulation case. And then we're going to ask, OK, if we change one thing or another, how does it affect uh, the resulting variance? All right, so for unregulated expression, such as here, the, if we look at the production and degradation as a function of n, right, so fn is, is just some constant k, whereas gn is a line that goes up as gamma n. Okay. Okay. Now, in this situation, we, if you do this integral, and really what you can imagine is what this integral looks like right around that steady, um, that steady state. Because that's kind of maybe what we want to know if we want to know something about, for example, the width of the distribution. Okay. Well, there's going to be two terms. In the numerator, there's an f minus g. In the denominator, there's an f plus g. Okay. Now, f minus g is actually equal to 0 right at that steady state. And that's why it's a steady state. Because production and degradation are equal. Okay. Now, as you go away from that location, you're, what you're doing is you're integrating the difference between the f and the g. Okay. And you can see that around here, these things are separating kind of, um, well, everything's a line here. And indeed, even if f and g were not linear, uh, close to, the, um, to that steady state, they would be linear. Right. What you can see is that as you're integrating, you're integrating across something that is growing linearly. Sorry, that's what gives you a quadratic. Okay. And that's why this effective potential ends up behaving as, uh, as if you're in a quadratic trap. Okay. Now, I encourage you to go ahead and like, do that integral at some point. I was planning on doing it for you today, but uh, we are running out of time. Once again, I'm happy to do it just, you know, just after class. Uh, and indeed, what you can see is that because you're integrating across here, you end up getting a quadratic increase in the effective potential. Right? And if you look at uh, what the variance of that thing is, you indeed find that the variance is equal to the mean here. Okay. So what I want to ask in terms of trying to get intuition is what happens if we pull these curves down? Okay. So in particular, let's imagine that we have a situation where all right, I'm going to reparameterize things. So again, we're kind of keeping the number, the number at the equilibrium constant. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an fn that looks like this, and a gn looks like this. So now gn is going to be some 1 half of lambda, and this fn is equal to k minus 1 half of gamma n. All right, now the question is, in this situation, what will be the variance over the mean? Right. 
Well, first of all, the variance over the mean here was equal to what? Although, should I? Should we do a vote? OK, here are going to be some options. Question is variance over the mean in this in this situation. All right, I'm worried that this is not going to work. But all right, let's just see where we are. Uh, ready? Uh, three, two, one. Okay. All right. So I'd say that at least uh, broadly, everyone. Okay, people are agreeing that yeah, the variance over the mean here is equal to one. And again, this is. The situation that we've analyzed many times, which is that in this situation we get a Poisson where the Poisson only has one free parameter, and that parameter specifies both the mean and the variance. Okay, so for a Poisson, the variance over the mean is indeed equal to 1. Right. So the Fokker Planck approximation actually uh, sort of accurately recapitulates that. Okay. Now the question is what will the variance over the mean be in the situation that I've just drawn here? All right, so I'm going to give you a minute to try to think about what this means. And there are multiple ways of, of figuring it out. You can uh, look at maybe the integral. You can think about uh, the biological intuition to make at least a guess of, of, where it, of what it should do. Right. The question is, if, um, if the production rate and the degradation rate look like this, what does that, um, what does that mean for the, the variance over the mean? So I'll give you a minute to kind of to play with it. All right, why don't we go ahead and vote just so I can uh, and get a sense of where we are. And also, uh, it's OK if you can't actually figure this out or you're confused. But, I w but go ahead and, and make your best guess anyways. Because it's also useful to, um, if you can guess kind of the direction it'll go, even if you can't figure out its magnitude. All right, so uh, let's, let's vote. Ready? Three, two, one. OK, so, um, all right, so it's, it's, it's a mixture now, I would say, of you know, A, B, C's, D's. Um, OK, um, yeah, no, I think th this, is, this is, I think, hard and confusing. Uh, I maybe won't have, um, yeah. All right, uh, all right I'll, I'll maybe say something, because it may be that talking won't, to each other won't help that much either. Um, OK, so in this case, what's relevant is both the f minus g and the f plus g. Okay. And, Turns out that f minus g actually behaves the same way because at the fixed point or at the equilibrium, it starts at 0 and then it actually grows in the same way as you go away from it. The difference is that the f plus g, where uh, that's very much not equal to 0, and f plus g at the equilibrium, this f plus g here is around 2k, whereas f plus g over here is around uh, 1k. What that means is that the, in both cases, you have a quadratic potential. But here, the quadratic potential is actually ends up being steeper. So if this were unregulated, then over here, we still get uh, a quadratic, but it's, a, it's a, with steeper walls. Okay. So actually here, um, this, the variance over the mean, uh, ends up being a half. Um, and it's useful to go ahead and just play with, this, play with these equations to see uh, why that happens. And I think that a nice way to think about this is, is in this limit where we pull this crossing point all the way down to 0. Right. 
Now we have something that looks kind of like this. All right, so very, very uh, low rate of degradation. But then also the production rate essentially goes to zero when we're at this point. That we could still parameterize as k over gamma if we want, you know, with some, you know. But you know, this could we could just think about this as, as being at a hundred of these mRNA, say. But then we're changing the production degradation rate, right? And the variance over the mean here. Does anybody have a guess of where that goes? Okay. In this case, it actually goes to zero. And this is an interesting situation because. Really, in the limit where there's no degradation, and it's all at the production side, what it's saying is that you produce, you produce, you produce until you get to this number, which might be 100, and then you simply stop doing anything. Right? You're not degrading, you're not producing. Right? But in that case, that all the cells will have exactly 100, maybe mRNA. And what the the Fokker-Planck uh, kind of formalism tells you is that just because production and degradation rates are equal. Right, f minus g is equal to zero, doesn't mean that uh, and that tells you that that's the equilibrium, but it doesn't tell you how much spread there's going to be around the equilibrium. Okay, if f and g are each larger, that leads to a larger spread because there's more randomness. Okay, whereas here f and g are both essentially zero at that point. What that means is that uh, that you kind of just pile up right at that precise value. Okay. All right, we are out of time, so I think we should quit. But I am available for the next half hour if anybody has any questions. All right, thanks.